Well, good morning. It's 8.35. We're five minutes late getting started, but I kept waiting for a student to show up. I was writing papers, and finally no one did, so I thought, let's go on and get started. So, um, let's go from current slide. Uh, if there are any students in the room, I'd see if there are any questions. I'd also make any announcements. I can't think of any right now, maybe one or two, but the... Uh, uh, no students are here, so let's continue where we were. Okay, we're in Chapter 2, First Order Differential Equations. 2.4 is exact equations. So uh, we're on page 68, which is uh, on top, near the top of the page, Example 3, an initial value problem. So let me get my pen set up. Okay. Here is the... Differential equation dy dx is equal to xy squared minus cosine x sine x divided by y times 1 minus x squared. Okay. And they give us here that y of 0 is equal to 2. Now, when I see a problem like this, and I hope your brains will start uh, sort of gearing this way as well. When you see something like this, at least when I do, I try always to note a couple of things. Number one, and this, the way it's written here, y cannot equal zero. Now, y of zero is two, but y itself cannot equal zero. What's more, x cannot equal, I said cannot equal, I put equal, x cannot equal plus or minus one. Well, we've got x being zero there, so that's okay. But just keep that in mind. The way this is written, y can't be 0 and x can't be plus or minus 1. Okay? <clears throat> so, now, looking back at the differential equation, which we were looking at before, too, do you think in any way this might be separable? No. Hang it up. Don't think there's any way you're going to separate these variables. Well, is this linear? No, okay? Two reasons here. Here you have a y squared, and here you have a y in the denominator, okay? Uh, you could divide this one into that and get it back to a linear form, but then you'd have cosine x sine x over y, which is not a linear form. So, no, no way this will be linear either. So right now, the only tool in our belt that we have to go with is an exact differential. Well, this is even written in differential form, so that's probably our first task, is to write it in differential form. So I'm going to do it this way. Multiply both sides by y times 1 minus x squared, and that's going to be times your dy. And then we're going to put a plus here, okay? And if we multiply this side by dx and then uh, added it to the other side, or subtracted it from both sides, I guess is the better way to say it. Well, we may even have a student. Oh my goodness, yes. Okay. Right. Huh? Well, uh, <laughs> What's that? I'm late. I thought I was early. Thought you were early? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I pulled in at 829. It's just I saw a friend from high school out there. Oh, I see. I was okay. like, hey, man. It's yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I uh, marked you present, and since I'm recording, I can't tell you what your score was on the test, but Damn. very good job. Oh, man, I'm so disappointed. I know, I, I, I figured you would be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get this set up for actually having a student in here. Uh, there is at least one announcement that needs to be made. Okay. It's one of those good news, bad news situations that I've told you this one before. 
Did you get a doctor's appointment? No, 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 nothing like that. <laughs> That's all bad news, okay? Uh, no, the, uh, this is the bad news. That, I mean, the good news is uh, next Thursday is 4th of July, one week from today. Okay, the bad news is it means we won't be meeting. Because is that behind? I think, I mean, that was incorporated in the class. Oh, it was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you want to try to make it up, we can. You don't? Know, oh, shucks, man. I was well, I mean, if it was already incorporated, I mean, we're, yeah. already, we're already kind of at a good pace. It, it, it's a state holiday, so, yeah, it gets counted. Um, What's that? Oh, I thought you were doing, like, push or push. Not quite. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else? Uh, oh, that extra weekend gives you more time to work on that Cal 3 test, doesn't it? Yes, sir. If it's not finished. Uh, I mean, uh, it's halfway finished. Okay, yeah. I'm on the 12.4 stuff. What's that? I got to do the 12.4 stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. All righty. Um, what we had here was a differential equation uh, with a boundary value, I mean, with an initial value. It's a first order differential equation, so you only need one initial value. Uh, and it's written like this, and you wanted to do a quotient rule, and I refuse to do that. Okay, uh, there's your initial condition. Now, what I said, because I sort of like to do this when I can think of remembering to do it, just looking at this form here, to me, it's pretty obvious why cannot equal zero, right? Why? So I put this over there. Because then you'd be dividing by zero. Then x can't. And x can't equal plus or minus one, because then you would be dividing by zero. But you see, this your initial condition is y is equal to two and x equals zero, so both of those are okay. I mean, that's okay. It doesn't violate any of that. Okay. If it did, you'd be in serious trouble. And the bottom is equals two, right? What's that? The bottom which is equal to. Well, we don't know. It's two times one minus. Oh, wait, yeah. What? When you plug it in, that would be when zero is in the numer zero for x, then, uh, uh, and that would have your whole numerator being zero, so it doesn't matter what you're doing. Yeah, I'll let it say, that's at the top, the x, y squared, and all that cancels out to be zero. Is yeah, it, yeah, because that sign zero. zero. Is yeah. Zero. But that's not really all that crucial here, because that's at the end of the problem. We put that in. Okay? Yes. Okay. So, uh, then we say, well, can we separate the variables here? What do you think? I'm assuming yes. Really? I mean, you already did. <laughs> okay, no, I mean to do separation of variables. Oh. Um, solution could, technique. Well, I mean, we could make it easier by putting that denominator up top. Okay, yeah, we, I, that's what I started doing. But can we solve this equation? by separating variables, getting the y's on this side and the x's on this side. What do you think? Yes. You think so? I'm just guessing. Huh? I'm guessing. I, I could tell. Okay, so, no. Because you see here we have, this is a product that would be okay, but then it's a sum that you can't, or a difference that you can't separate. These could be separable, but these will never be separable. Okay, do you think we can solve this using our linear techniques? Is that a linear differential equation? No. No. It's not linear because it's squared. You have y squared here. You have a y in the denominator here. If you divide, divide this into that, you can make that wire to the first power. But then you still have a 1 over y here. No. It was not in linear. Nowhere close to being linear. Okay? So our next, only, next tool we have in our belt is exact equations. Okay? So, to get this to look at exact equation, we need to write uh, exact differential. We need to write it in differential form. So that's where I started doing this. Multiply this over here times the dy, and then I was going to multiply this by dx, but we need them on the same side. So what I'm going to do is reverse these two. You know, you subtract this from this side, which is going to change this to a plus and that to a minus. So I'm going to put that in front. Is that okay? All right. Good deal. Okay. So this will be plus 
cosine x sine x minus xy squared dx and that's equal to zero. That is a requirement for an exact differential. For I, you can fiddle with the plus or minus uh, their form. You go back to the, the very beginning is always a plus in here, so that's why I wanted to do that. But the other thing is it has to equal zero. Yes. Um, is this the problem where it's like uh, m x y plus? N? Are we getting that form? Yes, so that's exactly where we're heading. Okay. Uh, now, so we've written it in the form. Does this mean it's solvable by exact? No, no guarantee of that at all. What's the way you test to see if it is solvable? Set up, uh, make sure they're equal to each other. So, do the well, they're not equal to each other. What equal to each other? Uh, both of them. So you want to you want to take the derivative with respect to x on the first one. Okay, the partial. Okay. The partial with respect to x of your first term, okay, and I'm going to write it out, y times 1 minus x squared, partial with respect to x, and what would that be? When you're taking a partial, I know you have, we are just getting, uh, we're there in Cal 3, so I don't know if you're up with this there. When you're taking a partial with respect to x, what do you do with the y? It goes away. No. You count it as positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, that's just like 7 times 1 minus x squared, or negative pi thirds, whatever. It's just a constant. And if you're taking the partial of that thing with this being a constant, all that super important. I mean, what you could do is multiply this by that, and that's still a constant, right? Y times 1 is y, right? And then y times minus x squared would be minus yx squared. Take the derivative of the constant, it's 0, right? Partial with respect to x is 0. Okay? And then what's the partial of the second part? So it's going to be just minus 2xy. Excellent. Okay, minus 2xy. Okay. Now what? Okay. The partial with this one, which is cosine x sine x minus xy squared with respect to what? Why? Why not? Okay. And what does that give you? Zero minus two x y. Minus two x y. Hey, 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 hey! That's what we like to see. All right. So those are equal. That's our test. Those are equal. So therefore, we can proceed. This is an exact differential. All right. Now, because I have a really sneaking suspicion we're going to need the room space, I'm going to erase those two. But that's necessary to do to make sure it qualifies as an exact differential. And it does. All right, to erase? Too late to say no. Okay. Uh, it just now got to you. Okay. Now, what do we do next? If it is an exact partial differential equation, which we just confirmed it is, then that means there is some f of xy 
equal to zero, that when you take the partial of this with respect to x, you get that. The partial of this with respect to y, you get that. Okay? And, uh, and we're going to back into it that way. So we do the interval. Say again? Don't we do the interval of both sides? Okay. The interval. What about the inter or integral? Integral. I thought you said interval. Okay. My hearing's not good. Okay. Uh, and we will ultimately be doing some integrals. Absolutely. But which one you want to assume first? Which one you want to mess with? The Y. The Y? Okay. So let's say if this is the function that this is going to result in, then we know that the partial of F with respect to Y has got to be Y times 1 minus X squared. Right? Okay, now, with that in mind, and I'm trying to think, I think we, yeah, okay. Um, let's write that as a differential and sort of lose the partials for a moment because we're assuming only dependence on y, we're sort of excluding the x. So we're going to write this as df is equal to y times 1 minus x squared dx, I mean dy, I'm sorry, dy, you know, just writing that as a differential form, and you've been dying to do this, so now we're going to integrate, okay, what does the first give you, f, f. equals, we'll go to respect to y, yep, Y squared over 2. Yes. Minus 1 minus X squared times Y squared over 2. Perfect. Yes. Could we move the 1 minus X squared in front of the integral? Yes, you could have because that's counted as a constant. Because you're taking the integral with respect to Y. I was going to say if I had thought ahead, I would have done that, but I didn't think ahead. I just wrote. Okay? So, yes, you could have taken that completely out front, but don't lose it. Okay? You're bad about losing <laughs> terms. Bless you. Thank you. Okay. Now, we're not through. Indefinite integral, what goes next? Um, plus, no, 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 no. Plus g of x. G of yes. X. No, y. X, you're right. Because plus, we have been doing them with respect to x first. We're doing this one. You chose to do it with y, so we're doing it with y. So now this is a g of x. Okay. Now, we're happy with that. But we also know, don't we, that the partial of f with respect to x had better turn out to be that stuff. Right? Okay, so let's take the partial of f with respect to x. The partial of f with respect to x is now going to be, now you do the first one there. Say that one again. Uh, y squared over 2 minus 2xy uh, squared. Okay. All right. You're writing what it is. Okay. I, I'll let, let me do that then. Y squared over 2 minus x squared y squared. And we're taking the partial of that with respect to x. Is that... No, that's not a y squared, that's a y. Okay, you say y squared, but yeah. Wouldn't it be over 2? Wait. So wait, 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 yeah. I um, don't have my eraser set up. Okay. And yeah, and that's over 2, too. Over 2 also. I meant to put the whole thing over 2, but I didn't have room. Okay, yeah. So that would uh, be y squared over 2. Okay, wait. Taking the partial with respect to x. What's y when you take the partial with respect to zero? A constant, and the partial of it would be the derivative of it would be zero. 
So it'd just be, it'd be 2xy squared, which are twos cancel out. Or it'd just be, no, it'd just be x, x squared, y squared. You're taking a derivative with respect to x. And we already agreed this one's going to give you a zero. So the next one, let's, I know it's sort of crowded there, so let's write it up here. The partial with respect to x of, now I'm going to change the way it looks a little bit. <coughs> I'm going to write as y over 2 times x squared. Was that legal? It's going to be, is it still y squared over 2 though? Where are you getting a y squared? Because so I thought we did the interval on the, and the interval. Okay. Yeah. The interval was, we got one minus. Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. I missed it. I had it there, and then I couldn't see it down here. Yeah, you're right. It's a y squared. Okay. There's my square here. Yeah. You got it. Okay. So wouldn't it just be y squared x? Exactly. Only my bad here, there was a minus sign in front of it. Oh, so nice. this is minus what? Minus y squared x. Okay. I'm going to write that as minus x y squared. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Not that anything special about it. Okay, plus. Now what's the next part? Um, plus g prime of x. G prime of x. Perfect. Okay. All right. Now. This, the partial of alpha with respect to x, has got to be this thing right here, right? That's what partial of alpha with respect to x is, right? That makes sense, though. Okay. Yeah, okay. Sense. Okay, let's, let's go back here. Remember, we're assuming there's some alpha of x, y equals zero, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're going to say the partial of f with respect to y uh, dy plus the partial of f with respect to x dx is also equal to zero when you do that. That's your differential, right? Now we started off by doing this one right here. We said this part here has to be your partial of alpha with respect to y. Now we've got to the place, so this part has to be, the partial with respect to x, has to be this thing. You see? Because in our form here, this is a partial with alpha with respect to y, and this is the partial of alpha with respect to x. Okay? Agreed so far? Okay, so we know this thing has got to be this. Cosine x sine x minus x y squared. So right? basically we're we're taking that partial f of dx and we're setting it equal to cosine x sine x. Well okay. Yeah. If you notice here, these are already exactly equal, so this is exactly equal to that. You're right on the money there. So this requires, huh? Okay. Oh, I was just making sure, like, we're not looking at all three. You know how it says df of dx equals x, y, z. Yeah, yeah. This is just telling you what this is, and this is telling you what, and we just did it here, and it's what that is, so therefore the two of them are equal. So now we're just dealing with those two. The partial of f with respect to x is out of there because that really doesn't tell us anything. This has all the, the meat in it right here. And these, of course, are equal. So that means that your dg dx, I'm going to write it that way, is equal to cosine x sine x. And guess what we're going to do with that? Well, yeah, write it in differential form, okay, and then integrate it, and that will be g of x equal to, 
antiderivatives, cosine x sine x dx. Uh, I kind of think not. That's not the easy way to do it. Okay. Maybe if we insist on it, are you substitution? Oh, oh, what? Oh, uh, that's smart. Uh, let's make the sign the U. Uh, I think that's a great idea. Let's let U equal sine X, then. What's the next part? Um, du, du is cosine equal to cosine x dx. I'm liking this more all the time. So then we just do g of x equals the integral of u times du. And that's just going to be u squared over 2. So then we plug it back in. It's going to be sine x squared over 2. OK, sine squared x over 2. I like it. OK? Now, we plug that back into this. Here we claim that the f as a function of x and y was this thing here, 1 minus x squared y over 2 plus your g of x is sine squared x over 2. Now remember what our original deal was, and I said this wrong, okay? Sorry about this. Up here at the very beginning, I thought something was weird here, and it is. This is not zero. It's a constant. It's a constant C. And since this is your f of x, y, you make it that constant C. There's your C. Don't ever put doing exact differentials like this. When you do these integrals, don't put in constants yet. Wait till the very end, and that is going to be your constant. Because this has to be a first order differential equation. You only need one parameter. That's it. Okay? Now, you can really, I think if you look at that very carefully, you can see there's a real good simplification. Multiply both sides of the equation by 2. And you get 1 minus x squared y plus sine squared x is equal to some new constant c, rather than that c1 or something like that. I'll just make it a new constant c. That should be our differential equation. Wait, so the two I mean, our solution. The two solution. just goes away. Say again? The two, just like, the two gets... Yeah, the, the new C is twice the old C. So do we put two C? You could do that. And rather than do that, I just like, I'll call that my new C. Okay. It's just a constant. Two times a constant, still a constant, just a different constant. Okay, I'm not very precise on this kind of stuff. Uh, I can remember a physics professor I had, uh, and there was... I mean, we weren't a small group, but it was you know, no more than 30 of us were in, went around to most of our classes, you know, physics majors. Uh, not all of them, but a lot of the classes were the same. We had this one guy, Mr. Thomas. I never knew his first name because back then all the professors called you Mr. Whatever or Miss Whatever if there were ever any women in the room. But at Georgia Tech back then, there were, there were precious few women in the room, <laughs> so, yeah. unfortunately. Out of a class of a, we had about uh, 8,000 students and about 200 of them were female. So that's a 40 to 1 ratio. Mm -hmm. So the the odds, if you had a class of 30, you probably weren't going to have a female in the room. I did have one uh, calculus class I started with my first term. We had the same prof, the, all five quarters of calculus. And there were three women in that class. It started off the class about 30, 35. By the end, we were probably down to 12 or 15. Those three women, they were bright. <laughs> they were, if only 200 got admitted, they were very, very bright, you know. And uh, so, anyway.
Uh, but anyway, this one professor we had, and Mr. Thomas always sat right in the front of the classroom. His glasses were slanted back on his head. I don't know why. Maybe how his head was done. And, you know, he's supposed to do it. And then his arm would shoot up. Shouldn't that be a, a minor sound there? Or shouldn't this be, a, yeah, and stuff like this. And Dr. Fleming was a theoretical physicist. He very seldom dealt with numbers. They were all letters all over the board. And so he was doing, and he, Thomas had asked him that about two or three times in one day now. Uh, uh, shouldn't that be a minus sound or stuff like this? So Dr. Thomas looked at him and went over, this is chalkboard, and took his chalk and put off a portion of the board here. Plus, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. He said, okay, there they are. Put them where they need to be. Because he didn't care whether it was plus or minus, you know. He was interested in the theory of it. Okay. So he said, there they are. Put them wherever you want to. <laughs> so anyway, this C is a C here. It's a different C there, but it, it's still a constant, just a constant. Okay, put it wherever you want to. Okay, no. All right, that's where it goes. But we're not through with the problem, are we? No. No, because we have an initial condition. So let's plug in, and we'll see what that C is, and we won't be worried about it anymore, will we? Okay. I mean, just for funsies, I'm going to make sure I'm heading in the right direction. Uh, They have done it slightly differently, and I do not know why. And I also did this again. I think I did blow it again. Oh, yeah, there's supposed to be a Y squared. That's a Y squared that <laughs> I didn't see it there, and I keep missing it. That's a Y squared, and that's a Y squared. Okay. All right. That is important. Okay. It's two, just put them on however you want. No, that won't work here. Okay. Now, in the text, they went the other way and let the U be cosine. But it shouldn't really matter. Okay? Uh, what will make a difference here is probably the sign of the constant, but we'll see. So, when X is equal to zero, Y should be two. So let's plug that in here. x equals 0, that first expression here is just going to be a 1, and y will be, y squared will be 4. Plus sine squared of 0, what is sine squared, what is sine of 0? Zero? 0. So our constant here is 4. Now the one they have in the book is a 3 because they use cosine. Okay? <laughs> I put 4 is equal to 4, which is always true, but that's our constant. Yuck! This is really giving me fits today. Wait. Didn't be that's three. C. Okay. It be two okay. All right. What I did, I put a 0 in for the X and a uh, 2 in for the Y. I put, I did the wrong Okay, well, you probably could do that as well. Uh, but it should come out for still. When you put uh, 0 for x, this becomes a 1. That becomes a 4. So this is 4 plus this zero. is 0, right? Sign of 0 is 0. So you got 4 is equal to C. So we got C is equal to 4. So we go back and write our equation. 1 minus x squared, y squared, plus sine squared, x is equal to 4. Now, what they have in the book, is it alright for me to erase some so we can justify these? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm going to come up here and start erasing some stuff. Uh, I'll try not to erase anything that's all that crucial. Okay. And let's see if we can convince ourselves those are the same answers. Okay, I'm convinced already, but I know you're a skeptic. 
So you probably aren't convinced, right? So in the book, they say y squared times 1 minus x squared minus cosine squared is equal to 3, is what they say. What's that? I can go ahead and tell you that's going to be 4 because the y squared turns into 4 minus, what should you call it? 4 minus. Okay, what are you doing now? I was You're taking in hours? I was plugging in the initial condition. Oh, they've already done it. Oh, and they got, yeah, three. And they got 3. And now I'm saying, are, is this answer that we got and this answer? that they got, they sure don't look the same, are they indeed the same? Okay, well, I'm going to do something to ours, okay, because mine, ours is easier. Let's do 1 minus x squared times y squared plus sine squared x is equal to 4. That's ours, right? Now I'm going to do this. I'm going to add a cosine squared x to our left-hand side, but that means I also have to add it to the right-hand side. Is that all legal? Yeah, so it should be legal in most states, right? Yay or nay? Yay. Okay, so what is sine squared plus cosine squared? One. One. So now we have 1 minus x squared, y squared, plus 1, equal 4, plus cosine squared x. Okay? Now, if we were to subtract a cosine squared x from both sides of that, and subtract 1 from both sides of that, the ones go away, and that leaves, and the cosine squareds on this side go away, and that would produce one minus x squared y squared minus cosine squared x equal three. Equal three. Ding ding ding. They're the same answers. Agreed or not? Good deal. Okay. So, I like ours better. Okay. The book, they're okay, but ours is better. Now, they like doing these solution curves, and since they're drawing them with computer graphics, I'm all in favor. They had me drawing them by hand, I'm not in favor. Okay, so uh, here's the solution curve for all those when you had the C in there. The different values of C, boy, they come up all sorts of weird things. Notice what we said here. Y cannot equal zero. And sure enough, there is no value on the x-axis that is allowed. Okay? Also, we said X can't be plus one or minus one. And you got vertical asymptotes in both of those places. So so far so good. When y is equal, x equals 0, y is equal to 2, there's the blue curve, that's the one that we're going to, uh, that's the one that's described by either their equation or ours. Um, that's it. Limit it to the domain from minus 1 to 1. That's all folks, it can't be anywhere else. If we had wound up on a curve out here, down here, over here, and stuff, then we have different domains. But anything in here is going to be limited between plus and minus one, and ours is. So that choice, that uh, y of zero equal two, when you got the x equals zero, that means of your possible domains here, that was anything less than minus one, between minus one and plus one, and greater than plus one, you're stuck in the middle. You have to be there because that hurts. Your initial condition is there. So all those solutions aren't good for that initial problem. Yeah, okay. Oh, it wasn't bad at all. That's 
Yeah. It was only one screen full. Okay. That's like 45 minutes. What's that? That's like 45 minutes. Yeah. Well, a little bit of storytelling in between, but okay. 40 minutes. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Oh. Um. Uh, yeah. We just covered that. Now. Remember when we had those linear equations and you couldn't solve them, you know, or even when you could, uh, by separation of variables, what we tried to do was come up with an integrating factor that made it solvable, okay? And that was the whole purpose of taking our integral of the P of X and then raising that to the E and then doing all that. That was our integrating factor. Well, guess what? It says, recall from that section, left-hand side of the linear equation, y prime, and let me go on and clear it. All right, and clear the screen? Yeah. Okay. We'll do that. Uh, back when we had a linear equation, y prime plus p of x, y is equal to, what we call it, g of that, f of x. Okay, f of x. There was our standard linear form. All right. All things here. Okay. This next one could be. It's about a whole page. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you can get it on the video. It's recording. All right. That was transformed into a perfect derivative when you multiply by the integrating factor. Remember, we call it mu of x. And when you multiply mu of x times this, mu of x times each term there, this became a perfect derivative, okay? And, you know, you change the right-hand side, but that's okay, too, okay? Uh, now, a similar thing can happen if you have your m of xy dx, they usually call it, plus n of xy, didn't leave enough room, dy equals zero. You remember that? Excuse me. That's our standard form for our exact differentials, right? But then what's the first thing we do? We take the partial derivative with respect to y. Yeah, and that with respect to? X and see if they're equal to each other. If they are, we proceed. But if they're not, right now we think we're stuck dead in the water, right? What do we do? Well, we're going to introduce an integrating factor. If these aren't perfect, the opposing partials aren't equal to each other, then introduce an integrating factor. Mu of x here and a mu of x here. Not the same mu of x we had before. Of course, when you multiply 0 by mu of x, it stays 0. And now, if you can work out to make this a perfect, when you take the partial of this with respect to x, y, and the partial of that with respect to x, if you can make this uh, so it passes the test, then you've got a new property. Okay? And it is an exact differential now. Okay? Um, So if you have a non-exact differential equation, see if you can come up with a mu of x that will work for you. Okay? Now, what follows here is a bunch of mess. Okay? Just like they always have these messes. And we come up with what the conditions are for this to work. Okay? So, if that's what we had, uh, and you do your test, uh, and let me let me clear the board so we have more room, uh, and then I'll write that second equa that last equation down. So we have mu of x, and this is mu of x y. Before it was mu of x. Now it's it's mu of x y. Mu of x y m of xy dx 
plus mu of xy n of xy dy equals zero. Okay. Started off the partial of m with respect to y and partial of m with respect to x are not equal. Okay. We're going to hope we can come up with the mu of xy that when you do this, it will be equal. So what we're hoping is the partial, and I'm going to leave off the xy's now, the partial of mu m with respect to y, we want to be equal to the partial of mu n with respect to x, right? That's our test. So we want that to be the case. Well, now we got a product rule. So let's do the product rule. What would that be? Um, mu. Partial with respect to? OK, wait. I'll hold off. I'll let you do it first. So what were you saying? Would those, OK, go ahead. Yeah. Would they be constants? I can't hear it. Would they be constants? They're not constant, no. They're both functions of x and y. I said I'm leaving that off. But they're both functions of x and y. So. Okay, that would be, in, in this case, that stands for partial of mu with respect to y times m, times m plus, plus partial with respect to m partial of m with respect to y, y times, mu. times mu. That would have to equal Your nomenclature at least a little to be desired, but you got the concept. Okay, good. All right. Now, that's what we wind up with. Okay. Now, what they're going to do next, we want to isolate the mu. Okay. Uh, or at least come close to isolating it. Okay. So therefore, let's get all the partial of mu's on one side. They put them on the, the left. It doesn't really matter. And all the mu's on the right. So that's going to be subtracting this one. Now, is it going to be all right if I quit writing all these partials and put the subscript? It's just a lot easier to write, and it takes up less room, and I have a problem with the room here. Okay. So if that's okay, let's call this mu sub x n, so I'm going to subtract that from both sides. Uh, times n. I put it in the wrong place, but it's okay. Um, and I'm going to also subtract m sub y mu from both sides. Okay? All right. So, here these go out, and here these go out. Okay? So what we have here is mu sub y m minus mu sub x n. Okay? Right hand side is uh, n sub x mu minus m sub y mu. Yeah, a What's that? So is the subscript, is that? Um, the subscript is partial with respect to. So this is partial with respect to y of mu. This is partial of mu with respect to x. Here's the partial of n with respect to x, and there's the partial of m with respect to y. Okay. So this has the mu's, this has the partial of mu's. Okay. Now,
All right. Now, they have a real Weasley worded statement at the top of page 69. Although M, N, M sub Y, and N sub Y are known functions of X and Y. We know those. That was part of our original problem. Okay? The difficulty here in determining the unknown function, mu of X, Y, um, in this form, and its partials, okay, uh, is that we must solve a partial differential equation. Since we are not prepared to do that, because we haven't done that, we make a simplifying assumption. Let's suppose that mu is a function of one variable. Well, now, wait a minute, folks. Why did you have us do it uh, x and y to begin with? Okay? Now they change and say just with respect to 1. Okay? Uh, suppose mu is a function of one variable. For example, say mu depends only on x, not on y. Okay? Now, so mu depends on x but not on y so mu sub x is okay mu sub y is equal to zero okay and the rest of that i think will be all right now yeah because if mu is a function mu a function of x alone then that suggests the partial of mu with respect to y, it has no y dependence, so that's going to be zero. Okay? Because all the x's would act as constants, and the constants act as constants. You don't have any y's, so that would be zero. So now we got things backwards, so we have to straighten them up a little bit. So would the partial of m in respect to y? We know those. We did them earlier. I mean, we can do them. Those are given in the problem. Mu, we are, are just throwing in there, but we don't know what it is. So there's our simplifying assumption. We're going to assume it just works for x. Now, if we proceed and we come up with something that still doesn't work, then we're going to back up and make mu a function of y alone. Okay? And if that doesn't work, then we hang it up and say, we can't solve this one with exact differentials. We hope that one of the two will work. Okay? So I want to change this around. Since this term here is zero, I want to make this one positive. So now this has that mu sub x times n is equal to, I'm going to flip these around, m sub y times mu minus n, yuck, I can't write. Let's write an n and put a tail for the mu. Okay, n sub x mu. I just uh, negated both sides. Flipped them over. Okay. Now, what this says that the mu sub x is equal to m sub y times mu minus n sub x times mu over n. Okay. Or factoring out the mu, m sub y minus n sub x over n times mu. Okay. Now, here's the issue now. This side of the equation is only depends on x. And the mu only depends on x. That was our assumption. Here, but all this mess depends on x's and y's. Okay? Unless, by some miracle, all the y's disappear. Okay? Now, that's going to be what we hope for. Okay? That somehow we can get the y's to disappear. Okay? Uh, in that expression. If indeed uh, that does happen and the y dependence disappears in that term in parentheses there, then we have a uh, first order ordinary differential equation and we can 
determine mu because that's separable as well as linear. Because if this depends only on x, that depends only on x, this is v, and this really is a, this is mu, mu prime now because that's not a, a partial anymore, only depends on x, d mu dx plus pi, both sides by the dx and, and the integral, and you get exactly what mu is. Now, if it doesn't, okay, uh, if, if the y's don't disappear in here, then we try the other technique and say mu is a function of y along. And then we go through the same mess here. Uh, and what would be the difference here? Uh, this is d mu dx is equal to that. If this winds up being a function, uh, some function, let's see. Is that d u or is it partial? That's d, because you see, up here we said we're assuming a derivative alone. So we shouldn't have done sub x's, we should have made those primes. Okay? All right, but we brought it over there as a sub x. So, let me erase some stuff here that we probably don't need anymore like maybe this up here. I hope we won't need it. Okay. Okay. So, going back, we're not going to require this to be a function of x and y, starting with x. And if mu if mu is a function of x alone, then d mu dx equal m sub y. Now that's a partial, minus n sub x, that's a partial, over n times mu, which is a function of x alone. If this thing turns out being dependent only on x, a function of x alone, we're good and we just integrate it, if we can. If we can't, if there's still a y somewhere in that term there, then we make the assumption that mu is a function of y alone. Okay? And if you make that assumption and go through this whole argument again, then you come up with the... Uh, I didn't write that well. Mu is a function of y alone. Then this would produce... Uh, d mu dy it looks fairly similar here and here's what that one would be n sub x minus m sub y over m times mu which is a function of y alone so these are the two things so if we if this comes up being some function of y alone then we're okay so we try it that way if we don't get that thing to be a function of x alone, hang it up, try it this way, see if this comes up being a function of y alone. If it does, we're okay. If neither one of them will work, you can't do it. But you hope one of the other will. Okay. That's the key here. Okay? Now, Uh, now I'm going to erase some more stuff here because we've leaving all this behind this is all our arguments for how we got to where we wound up so you're either in one of these two cases we hope anyway I should have left maybe that, but I didn't. Okay. Okay. Now, I put in those function names. They really aren't important. If that's a function of, G of Y alone, we're okay. Now, 
let's integrate one of those and see what we have. Uh, want to do this one first? All right. If this is a function of epsilon, there's a mu, then we can say this. D mu over mu is equal to this thing here, m sub y minus n sub x over n, all a function of x, dx. Okay? And remember, this is all a function of x. If we integrate both sides, what we get here is log of mu is equal to this integral. Okay. Okay, well then take an E of both sides, and this is your mu is equal to E to the integral of M sub Y minus N sub X over N DX. Now, we hope we can integrate that, because that came out being just some function of X. If it's an integrable function, we've got it. Now notice how similar this mu is to the last one. The last one was mu e mu was equal to e to the integral of p of x dx. Now it's just a lot more complicated, but just some function of x. Now if this is not a function of x, do this and see if that's a function of y. Then you do the same thing there. Mu would be e to the integral of that thing dy. If that's a function of y. Now if neither one of them happens, you can't do it. You just can't do it. But We'll see it. So there's our one. Here would be the other. If mu is a function of y, then that would be e to the integral of n sub x minus m sub y over m dy. Okay? So one of those two needs to work. Now, do you do the integral? No. You just see if it's a function. And if it is, you go with it. All right. When I saw you get up, I wondered, do you need a break, or is everybody okay? I was doing more. Yeah, okay. But everybody's all right? Don't need a break? Or do we? I don't know. We only got, what, an hour left? Huh? You do want to take a break? I wouldn't mind one, but I don't have to have one. So let's uh, pause. All right, we're back. Let's clear the screen. Whoa, that's not what I wanted to do. Let me see if that will work. Okay. I wanted to clear the screen, and I hit the wrong button, and it's not going to clear. Uh, how do I get out of this? It's not going to let me erase. Yuck. So I think what I have to do is close this out. Yuck, how dumb of me. Uh, don't save it and open it back again. Clean. I think I've done that once or twice in the past. Just hit the wrong key. Huh? I can't hear. No, no, the recording's still going. It's just I had to go to... No! Had to go to a clean page. So here we have a an equation. Oh, I've got to get my pen back. X, <coughs> y dx <coughs> plus 2x squared plus 3y squared minus 20 dy, that's a y, is equal to 0. First, 
Do you think that may be separable? Huh? No, because the x and the y. Yeah, because you have pluses and minus, pluses between x's and y's. Just having products or quotients of x's and y's, fine. But when you have plus or minus signs between the x's and y's, there's no way you're going to separate them. Okay? Not separable. Is it linear? No. No. Is it even first order? Uh, what's that last part? 2x squared plus 3y squared. 20. Okay. Dy. Is it uh, even a linear equation? It's not. I'm not linear. Is it first order equation? No. Yeah, it is. How? Dy dx. You don't have any d2y's or d2x. Yeah. Well, I thought it was okay. Yeah. yeah, first order. Okay. So, it's set up to be like it has potential for an exact differential. Well, let's see if it is. What's the test? Partial of xy with respect to y. Why not? And what would that be? That's going to be x. X, you got it. And let's try this one, the partial of 2x squared plus 3y squared minus 20 with respect to x, and what's that going to be? 4x. And, oh, yeah, with respect to x, yeah, 4x. Plus 0. And the others are zeros. I think that's, they're not equal, right? So, this isn't an exact differential. Is there anything you could do to make it exact? Okay, our test failed, so let's get rid of the test. Okay, now if, uh, so is there any mu that we can multiply by both sides and it either be, needs to be a function of x or a function of y? Okay, now since both of these come, came out in terms of x, uh, then, and I wish I hadn't erased that, <clears throat> let me put it back again. The partial of xy with respect to y, and that was x, and the partial of this thing, 2x squared minus 3, uh, plus 3y squared minus 20 with respect to x is 4x. Okay. Now, notice this is your m sub y. This is your n sub x, right? Sure. Okay. Now, notice both of them are functions of x. If you look up a little bit higher uh, in the page, or you don't have your page, but if you pick up the last notes that you had, the thing that we wanted to be a function of x alone was the, uh, that mu sub x. What's that? Only if you want to. It's up to you. I'm sorry? I don't know if you're applying any Well, uh, if you have it in your notes, you're probably okay there, too. If you remember what the mu sub x was, it was e to the integral of m sub y minus n sub x over n, right? dx. Now, this is a function. Wait, wait, wait. Not quite. The numerator is a function of x alone. The denominator is not. Okay? So that's why I, I pulled this up, just to see. Your m sub y minus n sub x over n would be x minus 4x over 2x squared plus 3y squared 
minus 20. Okay. Say again. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. We're not even going to think of doing that. That's not going to be factorable. We don't. Uh, no. Okay. The point here is that there's no way that's going to be a function of x alone. The numerator is a function of x alone. Okay. But the denominator is not. It depends on x and y, and there's no way you can eliminate the y's. So this isn't going to help us. Okay. So this one is out. Okay, we're not going to do this one, which means our only hope is if mu is a function of y. I probably should have left everything there, but it's just as easy to do this, I think. So, number one, that's not going to help, so I, I can go on and erase that too. Okay, let me go. Yuck. Okay, let me go on and erase these two. That didn't work. I uh, erased it once. Now I'm erasing it again. Okay. Now our only hope now is that if we can come up with a mu as a function of y alone. And what was that? That mu as a function of y alone was going to e to the integral of n sub x minus m. No. Yeah, that's right. I have to get way back from the page. This blue is hard to read. I can read it up there. N sub x minus m sub y. I thought that was it. Over m. Okay. Dy. Okay. So what we need to investigate is this one. N sub x minus m sub y. Well, wait a minute. We just had those on the board, didn't we? M sub x, n sub x was 4x, remember? Wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. And n, m sub y was x. Okay. Yeah, so that's going to be a function. So, oh, but it's a function of x along. Oh, no. Okay. So this is going to be 3x. That's your numerator n sub x minus m sub y. That's what we had to begin with. But we're going to divide it by m. Ha! Look at your m. Your m is x times y. Okay, yeah, we'll do that. The x's are going to go out, and now you can integrate that, as you said, dy, not dx. dy. Huh? Isn't it all, uh, it's for M, it's X, Y, DX? Okay, no, you don't need, you only need the M. M is just that part, N is this part. The DYs are, are your differentials, DXs and DYs. Okay, and you're going to do E of that. Hey, that's going to be okay, isn't it? Why? Look at what that gives you. E to the, what is the integral of 3 over Y? Antiderivative of the 3 over y. Oh. We take the y. Uh, it would just be ln. Yes, 3 times ln of y, right? Yes. And again, we don't do any plus c's on this. So this is going to be e to the. Now you can take that 3 and move it up to be an exponent, right? So that's going to be the log of y cubed. You remember that property of exponent of logarithms, don't you? A N L B equals L N D A. B to the A, yeah. Exponent. Yeah. Sounds like you do a bit of memoriz memorization. Is that right? Okay. And it's right. Well, what's E to the log Y cubed? E and log are inverse functions of each other. So what is e to the log y cubed? Uh, y cubed? That's y cubed. There's your integrating function as a function of y alone. Okay? So what do we do with it? 
All right, I'm going to write some stuff here just because I don't have much room. And I want to clear off some of the extraneous marks I've made. Okay, and I think I'll get rid of all this too. But I do want to leave that. That your mu's of y is equal to y cubed. Okay? Now, what are we going to do to it? Multiply it by everything on both sides of the equation. So this will become x, y to the fourth dx, right? Plus, multiply y cubed by everything. What do you get? Um, 2x squared y cubed. Good. Um, plus 3y to the fifth. Good. Minus 20y to parentheses. dy, dy equals, equals zero. zero. Y cubed times zero is still zero. Now we do our test again. This new M, is it all right? You still call it M? Okay. The partial of this with respect to what? X. No, we're doing our test. Y. Why? Why not? Okay. Okay. And what will that give us? X, no, 4XY cubed. Okay. So let's do the partial of this one. 2X squared Y cubed plus 3Y to the fifth minus 20Y cubed. Do that with respect to what? With respect to what? Sorry, uh, X. X. Okay, and what does that give us? Four. Four. X. X. Y, y cubed. cubed. Plus zero. Minus zero. Three. Equals four. And yes, indeed, we found, now we've made it an exact differential. Okay? Now, what do we do with it? Um, let's, uh, All right, here's where we start over again. We've shown that it is, so let's erase all this. That was all to get us to something we can do. Okay? So we won't need this anymore. So let's get rid of those. And now we start over. And what's our first assumption? Since that is an exact differential, that means there is some, you like calling it the same thing? F of XY equal to C. Equal to C that this is going to satisfy. And if that is indeed the case, then the partial of f with respect to x dx plus the partial of f with respect to y dy has to equal zero. If you take the partial of both sides of this, that's what you get. Okay? Anyone you want to start with? It looks like the F will be easier on doesn't. I mean, the uh, the X ones will be easy. So let's try that. Uh, this is saying, if that's the case, that the partial of F with respect to X is equal to X Y to the fourth, right? Where do we go from there? Okay, make that a DX here. This is assume that's a DF. So this gives us f is equal to, integrating this with respect to x, and that would be what? Um, y, to the fourth. y to the fourth. That's it. Oh, wait. 
Uh, 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 derivative. You're taking a derivative. Uh, be x squared over 2. x squared over 2. Not all. Uh, no, you've already done the integrals, so you don't have those anymore. Plus, Plus g of x, g of y. Oh, oh, you said G. Okay, I thought you said D. Okay, you're right. G of Y. You're absolutely right. Perfect. Okay? Now, what do we do with that? Take the partial of that with respect to y. Yeah, that's what I said. Uh, oh, okay. And what's that? Partial of f with respect to y then would be? I can't hear. I gotta write it down. Okay, yeah, take your time. Squared, or three x squared y cubed. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Where do you get a three? Okay, you're taking derivative. Yeah. Respect to y. Yeah. So with the three, the y fourth becomes three y. Okay, y cubed, is that what you mean? Four y cubed, but you're over two, so that would be that, right? All right, is that what you meant? Okay, I'm sorry, I was misunderstanding. What else? G prime of y. Perfect. Okay. Now, this thing, this partial valve with respect to y, is supposed to be this thing up here, right? So we set it equal to that equal to 2x squared y cubed plus 3y to the fifth minus 20y cubed. And you notice that these terms are identical. So get rid of them. And this is your dy dx, so make, I mean dg dx. So make your dg over here equal to 3y to the fifth minus 20 y cubed d y. I'm sorry, this is, yeah, that's a g, this is y. Integrate both sides, and what's your g? these first terms are identical, they better be, you get rid of those, and then your g prime, notice it's only functions of y, which is fantastic, and then so this g prime is dg dy, so this is your g dg, there's your dy, integrate, this gives you a g, and I'll put g of x, it's not g of x, it's yep. g of y, sorry. And what would it be? Integrating that bottom. Very good. Don't do it mess with the plus C. Okay, just do the G of Y. Now let's go back in and plug in what? Right here. This step here. This was 
x squared y to the fourth over 2 plus your g of y, which is 1 half y to the sixth minus 5 y to the fourth. And that thing, that f, is equal to your constant c. Okay? Now, again, I'm going to pull a slick one on you, if you don't mind. I copied it right. I think I did. I don't like those fractions too much. I mean, I like them okay, but they're not my favorites. So I'm going to multiply everything on both sides by 2. Okay? And that's going to be... Uh, here's your differential equation. x squared y to the 4th plus y to the 6th minus 10 y to the fourth is equal to some new c. It's going to be twice the old c. That's it. That's our solution. This didn't have a initial value, so we got... Now, they left the one-half in there. Sorry about that. Okay, I don't know why. <clears throat> Mine's just as good as theirs. Uh, if you look at the line below there, you'll see it's the same thing. 1 half x squared y to the 4th plus 1 half y to the 6th minus 5 x y to the 4th equal to c. That's fine, or you can get rid of your denominators and write it the other way. Last time they did, this time they didn't. There's no rhyme or reason to this. Not too much anyway. All right. Any questions? There is a remark page at the top of page 70, or a block at the top of page 70. Um, and you can read that if you'd like. What I wanted to point out to you, and I wish I had done it when we were doing it, when you do that partial at the very first step, partial of this thing, m with respect to y, and the partial of n with respect to x, if you look at those integrating factors, those are exactly what you use there. Partial n with respect to y, partial n with respect to x. I made the mistake of erasing them twice. Those are exactly what you use in your coming up with the integrating factor. So once you do it, it's not wasted. If they don't come up equal to each other, then use them over here. And in one case, it's the m sub y minus n sub x over n or n sub x minus m sub y over n, uh, m, like we had here. So hang on to those, because they're useful. They're useful over here in finding the integrating factor. Now, if they're equal to each other, you're fine. Go on and do your thing. If they're not equal to each other, then use them here. That, don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Be lazy. Okay. So um, anyway. So basically, we're, we're doing do, but we, we got to do that extra step to make sure they get equal to each other. Yeah, it, that's a test. you got to do the test. As soon as you have the equation, do the test. If they're equal, proceed. If they're not equal, then rearrange them a couple of times. See if you get one being a function of x alone, the other being a function of y alone. If you get either of those to happen, go with that integrating factor. Okay? And it's so similar to the old one that it's uh, pretty nice to have. All right, homework exercises here. Do any of the odds 1 through 20, 19 that are in the back of the book? Do any of the odds 21 to 25 that are in the back of the book? Uh, do 27. Do 29 if they're in the back of the book. Do any of the odds 31 to 35 if they're in the back of the book? And do number 37 if it's in the back and try 39 if it's in the back. The discussion problems, if any of those are in the back, take a look at them. Uh, most of the time they're not, but it could be that you'll find they are. Any questions on 2.4? Can I erase this? All right. Let's move on to 2.5. We've got about 30 minutes to spend on this. This is solutions by substitution. Okay? Now, as you 
might have observed, things are getting a little, little bit more complicated every one of these, okay? So, uh, let me see if I can remember. Uh, separation, linear, exact, substitution, and, eh, or was it? Oh, homogeneous. Maybe that was next. Bernoulli. There used to be some acronym that some people used that made it easy. I'd never heard it before, but one student came up with it uh, a couple years ago, and I can't remember what it was. But anyway, pretty nice. All right. We usually solve the differential equation by re recognizing it is a certain type. Is it separable? Yes or no? If it is, go to the separation of variables. That's so easy. If it's not separable, is it linear? It's not quite so easy, but you can do it. If not linear, is it exact? Okay, we just went through that. Even if it's not exact, can you make it exact with an integrating factor? Okay. Um, now, it is not uncommon, this is quite a sentence here, to be stumped by a differential equation because it does not fall into one of those classes of equations you know how to solve. The substitution procedures that are discussed in this section may be helpful. Okay? So, the first. The first step in solving a differential equation consists of transforming it into another differential equation by means of a substitution. Okay? For example, if we have dy dx equal f of xy, and substituting y is equal to g of x u, where u is regarded as a function of x, if g possesses first partial derivatives, then by the chain rule, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That was a lot of mess in there. So let's say we have this dy dx is equal to f of xy. Okay. Now, let's just imagine it's not separable. Okay? It's not linear. Then you write it as an exact and you not exact. You try integrating factors. Can't come up with one that works. So you're stuck with a dy dx equal f of xy. Okay. So here's what you try. Let's try a substitution for y. y is equal to some other function, g, which is a function both of x and of u. Now, they've thrown in a new variable here, u. Now, this is the weird part. u is regarded as a function of x. And here's Daniel. Um, okay. Now, I probably should have said this earlier, but I didn't think of it until right now when I was just putting the, the uh, Daniel's attendance in. <coughs> and this may, and it does apply to more than one of you, by the way. Uh, I believe I saw an email from the dean, the academic dean, that we're supposed to make some sort of report, maybe either yesterday or today. That's what I was going to look into today. And it's basically something about students who are at risk of failing as we're getting close to midterm. Now, usually we have a midterm progress report, which we're going to do in about a week. So I don't see why we're doing both of these, but they wanted it. So. Uh, so if I don't have a score from you, either as a paper or as a test, in all the courses you're taking, I'm probably going to have to put your name in there. It's not going to hurt anything, but just to let you know, if someone gets in touch with you, that's going to be why, because I had to submit that. Now, I have to look into it and see, because I had never, we've never done this before 
we have midterm progress reports, but we don't haven't had this. So this is something new. I've got to find out a little more about it. But it just happened when I was blocking your attendance that I happened to remember she said to do that. Okay. So anyway, let's get back to here. So here we have u, not mu, u as some function of x alone, which makes, and this is the part that's sort of bizarre here, if u is regarded as a function of the variable x, then your y is no longer a, is a function of x. And why didn't they just say that? But uh, I don't know. If u possesses first partial, I mean g possesses first partial derivatives, then by the chain rule, okay, so here's what we've got here. Um, and we're doing dy dx, which is what we have here. So dy, this is a dy dx, is equal to the partial of f with respect to x, okay, Well, they're skipping some steps here. Yuck. Okay. They're not doing what I thought they were going to be doing. They're going here. Okay? Not up here, but over here. dy dx would then be the partial of g with respect to x dx dx, which we know what that is, 1, plus, plus the partial of g with respect to u. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Isn't this the, uh, that's sort of like the chain rule in Boolean algebra. Exactly. Like, isn't it the same thing? It is exactly that. That's what it is. We're doing the chain rule. Okay? But we're doing it with this one. I thought we were going to be doing it with this one. We're doing it with that one. Uh, if y is some function of g, and g is a function of u, x, and u, then this would be times du dx. Now, the fact that we said u is a function of x alone, that means we can put that in. Well, this is equal to 1, okay? So now what we have here is uh, dy dx is equal to partial of g with respect to x plus the partial of g with respect to u dg, no, du dx. Okay, sorry, that's ugly. Okay. Now. They rewrote it as subscripts, but that's okay too. Okay, now, if this is dy dx, we can go up here and put that here instead, okay? Uh, so let's put this instead of the dy gx. And we're going, I'm going to do the same thing they did because it's a lot easier to write. g sub x... Say again. See, this is a second. Um, dy dx equals that we have circled. Right. When we plug that into the dy of dx equals x, f of x. That's y. it. That's exactly it. Okay. So that's going to be g sub x plus g sub u du dx is equal to. Now, the right-hand side of that, we're changing, we're taking the y's out. So this is f of x, g, x, u. Okay. Okay. Now... We've lost a dy dx and now have a du dx. Okay? Now, what we're going to do is solve for this and see if this new differential equation is solvable somehow. Maybe by separation of variables, maybe by linear, maybe by exact differentials. We'll see if it's solvable. So what our new equation is, 
du dx is equal to f of x g of x and u minus g sub x divided by g, g sub u. What we did was subtract this from both sides and then divide by that. Okay? So there's a new differential equation. Okay? They renamed this to be some capital <coughs> U, capital F, as of X and U. No longer a Y in it, X and U. Okay. Now is that implying it's like the antiderivative? Say this again? Is that the F like an antiderivative F? No, I, I, I don't know why they chose a capital F. I wish they hadn't because that's what it implies. But it's not necessarily. Okay? It might turn out being that, but I don't think we can jump to that thing. Because it's you got these G's in here, it's not that closely related to this little L. Usually that would be the antiderivative of the little L. I don't think with all these G's in there you can say that. Okay. Maybe it'll turn out that it is, but we can't say it yet. Now if we can uh, determine a solution for u, and that solution comes up being, and why they changed it to phi of x. It seems like this author just loves to throw in different names, and I can't see any advantage to putting another variable, in, I mean, a uh, function name in here, but he does. What is that u? Does that say u is equal to u, u of x? That means it's a function of x alone. It's not a function of x and y, just a function of x. Yeah, and that's just saying u is a function of x alone. That's my shorthand for saying that. I didn't want to write is a function of x alone. I just put u of x. Okay? Now, now we're going to call that phi of x, which is a function of x alone. Okay? Now, um, The only place that the U shows up is right there, and that they're going to put a phi of x in instead, okay? Then a solution of the original differ differential equation is y is equal to that g function, whatever it was, as a function of x and now phi of x. Okay. Okay. Now, that's where all the, what is going to follow comes from those. Okay. Comes from this kind of stuff we've just done here. Now, Let's go back to, and, and this just seems like a huge jump to me, but it, they do it, so we'll, we'll jump. We don't know what's down there, but we're going to jump. I don't know. Y'all are probably too young to remember Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It was a movie, Paul Newman and Robert Redford. One of the best movies of all time. Huh? Uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Really good Western movie. Just so bizarre. Another good one was the same two stars where the... Uh, what was the name of that? Oh, I can't remember. But anyway, the reason I brought up Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, they were being chased by these... They were, they were crooks. They were train robbers, they were bank robbers, they just, you know, you know, but they were nice guys, except they robbed banks and trains and stuff. So the uh, honchos went after them and hired this really super, unbelievably dogged 
guy to chase them down. And he was on their things, and they were trying to escape, and they were went up a mountain, and when they finally got up the mountain, they said uh, the only way out was to jump off the cliff into a river way down there. And up to this point, Paul Newman had been sort of the happy-go-lucky guy, and Butch Cassidy, who was Robert Redford, he was the uh, real serious guns, gunslinger. Okay. So they got up here and were getting ready to jump. He said, no, no, there's got to be a different way. He said, come on, just jump. You know, he said, no. He said, there's something I've never told you. He said, what? What? They're after us. What, what is it? I can't swim. He said, oh, don't worry about that. The fall will probably kill you. So, you know, that's the thing. Where they just come up with this new thing here, but don't worry. Jump into it. The fall will probably kill you. No, I didn't mean that. But uh, we're going to do a homogeneous equation. But if you can't find that movie, rent it. It's one of the best. The other one, I wish I could remember the name. Oh, yeah. And you've heard of Robert Redford. The Sundance Film Festival. Oh. He he's in charge of that. That's how they named it Sundance oh. after his character in that movie. Oh. Yeah. I think Paul Newman he voiced uh, this dude in Cars. Have you ever seen Cars? It's what? Have you ever seen the movie Cars? Cars? Yeah. Did he do a voice in that? Yeah, he did not. Oh yeah. That's okay. Uh, yeah, he was a great actor, uh, and he was married to a really good actress too. Uh, Joanne Woodward. She probably was a better actress than he was an actor, but he got a lot more money than she did, of course. But anyway, uh, and what I found out recently is that they were completely out of the Hollywood scene. They didn't mess with Hollywood at all. They lived in some ranch somewhere out in Idaho or Montana or somewhere, and they only came in to do movies, and then they'd go back home. They just they did not want the glitz, the glamour, the fame, and all that. They just came in and made great movies and went home. <laughs> so I like them even more. He also came up with a, a series of salad dressings and stuff, Newman's Own. Oh, that's, that's Paul Newman. Newman. Yeah. Oh, I've heard of Newman's. Is, yeah. All the proceeds go to charity, too? Yes, exactly. That's awesome. He made lots of money in movies, so he just liked cooking and doing things. So all that, yeah. Good, good guy. Uh, great actor. Okay. So, we're jumping into what we call homogeneous or homogeneous equations. Okay, now, and this lead off to me leaves a lot to be desired. Here's what they say if a function possesses this property that f of tx ty is equal to t to the alpha times f of xy then of for some real number alpha then we say that this f is a homogeneous function homogeneous okay and to me, uh, and they say of degree, goodness gracious, of degree alpha. Okay. For some alpha. Okay. Now, to me, that definition is yuck. What in the world are they talking about here? Okay. Then they give this example. Here's an example. f of xy is equal to x cubed plus y cubed. Yeah, I lost my place there. y cubed. Okay? Let me put it a lot simpler for you. If the degree of every term in the equation adds to be the same, it's a homogeneous equation. Homogeneous equation of that degree. This is degree three, that's degree three. So that's homogeneous or homogeneous of degree three. Now, this test they do, yeah, it's right. 
f of tx, ty would then be tx cubed plus ty cubed, and that would be t cubed x cubed plus t cubed y cubed, which would be t cubed times x, square, x cubed plus y cubed, and that would be t cubed of f of x, y, where you started. Yeah. But why go through all that? Just look at them and see. What's the degree of this? What's the degree of that? If that's the same degree, it's homogeneous. I, th I mean, all this T mess, yeah, it's doable and you can do it. It just takes up so much room, space, and everything else to do it. All you have to do is look at the degree of every term. If the degree of every term is the same, it's homogeneous. Okay? Or homogeneous. However you want to say it. Now, so if, if it was x squared and y cubed, would it be hetero? <laughs> I guess so. Uh, so, then you couldn't use what we're going to come up with. Okay. Um, whereas f of xy is equal to x cubed plus y cubed plus 1 is not homogeneous heterogeneous or whatever you want to call it because that third term is not of the same degree as the first term, two terms, okay? So it's not homogeneous or homogeneous or whatever. Uh, now, let's jump to something else. It seems like we're going backwards here. If we have that, this looks familiar, m of xy dx plus n of xy dy equals zero. Okay, that looks awfully familiar. It's homogeneous or homogeneous if both coefficient functions m and x are homogeneous functions of the same degrees. Okay, and then they go to that t mess again. Okay, completely unnecessary. Okay, in my mind. Okay. Now, in addition, if m and n are both homogeneous functions of the degree alpha, we can also write uh, and again, I, I think we may use this one again, so I do want to do this one for you. And it really sounds like, or seems like, they're just going in circles here, but it, it, it is, okay. M of xy, okay, is equal to x to the alpha, okay, m of 1, u, okay. To me, that's a big step of faith. Just jump, the, the fall will kill you anyway. Okay. It just is a big leap of faith there. But they're saying it's true. I'll take take their word for it. Okay. Oh, notice there's a U in there. And N, I don't know why that looks like an M, doesn't it? N of XY is going to be X sine sine alpha n of 1u. Okay? Okay, where is this u coming from? Here's what u is. Where u is equal to x over y. Okay? No, I'm sorry, y over x. I thought that didn't seem like that could possibly be true. y over x. Okay. In other words, <coughs> If you factored out that x of alpha, which is homogeneous in that degree, uh, then uh, 
and this x over y, u is x over y, u, u is x over y. Uh, it gets all the x's, it pulls the x's out here, and the y's are combined like this, uh, because you've divided out the x's here, but multiplied by the x's there. Kind of. That's a, a real crude description of it, but that's the only way I can kind of make any sense out of it. You just have to take your word for it. That's true. Okay? However, if that doesn't work for you, you can change it to m of xy equal y to the alpha times m of u1 and n of xy is equal y to the alpha n of u1 and this time your u is x over y okay i glanced down at the page i looked at the wrong one and said it can't be true i'm sorry i blew it again they're calling these v's to keep from confusing them with the u's from before okay this is v1 v2 and this is v is equal to x over y. Is that like the, is that going into the vectors? I'm sorry? Is that, is that going into vectors? No, 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 no. It's just, they're using u's and v's, but they're not vectors. Okay. Uh, this is just showing you some substitutions that will work for these kind of functions. They have to be homogeneous functions. They have to be. Okay. And if they are, then these substitutions may make your life easier. And this okay. U also, I mean, uh, if I'm remembering from uh, from trig, U is kind of the could that be inverse of tan? The what? U over at, U equals Y over X. Is that anything like a tangent? Is that what you're asking? Okay. If you were dealing with Ys and Xs being on a coordinate system, that would be. We're not on that coordinate system. Yeah, right. Uh, but anyway, um, now, if you'll notice here, another way to express this is that y is equal to ux, and another way to express this is x is equal to vy. Exactly. Now, they may say it in reverse. No, that's how they say it. Uh, so that's another substitution. I actually like that better because I don't like dividing as much as I do multiplying. But anyway, these are what you come out of this. Okay? Now, here's the basically the bottom line here. They tell you what to do with all that and they do a lot of maneuvering and then they say don't memorize anything here rather work through the procedure each time and that's what we're going to do we just have to learn the procedure and i've exposed you to it but uh let's see how it works in a problem so let's do example one i don't know if we're going to have time to finish it but we'll at least get it started okay so here's the problem x squared plus y squared dx plus x squared minus xy dy is equal to zero. Okay. Number one, not separable. You have those pluses and minuses in there. Number two, not linear. You have y squareds. Okay? Number three, is it exact? Sort of set up as if it would be, but let's see if it is. What's your test? Um, partial derivative with respect to y of x squared plus y squared. All right. And, then we just, and what would that be? That would just be a 2y. 2y, okay. And the other one? We do with respect to x, and that would just be 2x. 
Not quite. Huh? 2x minus y. Got it. Okay, with respect to x, it would be 2x minus y. Now, I can't say for sure, but these are not closely enough related that I think that if you did those manipulations we did before, like the this one minus that one over this one, I don't think you're going to eliminate anything, or that one minus this one over that is not going to eliminate anything. I don't believe so. So, in other words, you can't make it exact. Five minutes, or we are done. Five minutes, five more minutes. So, I don't think that's going to work. Okay? So, we're going to hang these up. Okay? Didn't seem like it's going to work. Now, maybe it would. I haven't gone through to see. But right now, let's just imagine it doesn't. And I, I think probably it wouldn't. Okay? But what we can note here is that these are homogeneous. Look at this. Degree of the first term? Second. Second degree? That one? Second. This one? Second. And this one? One. X1, Y1, 2, 2. Yeah. So it's, all of those are degree 2. Okay? Now, uh, here's the substitution. All that other mess they did, okay? Uh, remember, kind of what they finally got down to the bottom line, and it's the one I said I like to remember better than others. Let y equal ux. Remember that? We did all the other stuff. Let's just let that be your thing. So let's rewrite them with that in case. Okay? x squared plus u squared x squared dx plus Plus x squared, x squared minus, minus x times u times u of x or u times x. So x squared u, right? Yes. Now, <laughs> what is your dy? That's the only thing we have to do here. Don't forget that. If y is equal to u, d, u times x, then dy is equal to u dx plus x du, right? Product rule. Yay? Yay. Okay, that means, yeah, we are really in favor of it. So this is going to be times u dx plus x du. All right. Now, we've got a little foil problem over there. So let's leave this one alone. x squared plus u squared x squared dx plus, now let's foil these. Okay? That's going to be an x squared u dx, right? I'm going to do my other dx. That will be this one. Minus x squared u squared dx, right? C. Huh? C, okay. Then let's do our dy, uh, du's, and this will be a uh, plus x cubed du, and the next one will be a minus x cubed u du. Has it, this made it so much more fun, okay? And that's going to be equal to zero. Okay? Now let's get all of our dx's together. Okay? You have an x squared plus u squared x squared. And then you got a plus x squared u. And you got a minus x squared u squared. Oh! But these two disappear. That's all times dx 
Now let's get our du's together. And that's just this last two. Plus x cubed minus x cubed u du equals zero. Okay. Are we out of time? Huh? It's 46. 46? Yes, oh, okay. We are out of time. Okay, we'll pick up in this problem next time. Sounds good. Okay. Um, and we haven't quite gotten to that line yet. We're probably going to start it all over again, but we'll do. And did all of you get the good news, bad news situation? Yeah. The good news is... Next Thursday is 4th of July, national holiday, state holiday. But the bad news is we won't be meeting next Thursday. We'll be here Tuesday, but we won't be here on Thursday. Sorry about that. Get over it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you can look at it, but you, I, can't, I can't return it to you until I get everybody's in. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Right. Good deal. What's that? Will I be here Wednesday? Yeah. All day Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Monday and Wednesday. Okay. Now, the only time I'm not on this campus is sometime on Tuesday and Thursday. I've got a class over on the Birmingham campus uh, that I'll leave here no later than 4.30. But because I'm trying to get all my evaluations signed, some days I'll leave earlier than that to go over there and get with, meet with the instructors. So I'm here usually at least through lunch, but then sometime in the afternoon I go over to the Birmingham campus. As soon as I get all those done, then I'll stay here until close to 4.30. I'll be here before 12. Right? When? On Wednesday? Yeah. Okay, now Wednesday I'm in class all day. What do you need uh -huh. me for? Yeah, I've got, I've got Cal 1, Cal 2, and Cal 3 on Wednesday, and they're each 2 hours and 55 minutes. So 2 hours and 55 minutes, 8 till... Uh, 8.30 to 11.25, from 11.30 until 1.25, no, 2.25, and from 2.25 until 5.25. So I've got, um, I'm here, I've got office hours between 8 and 8.30, and then 5 minutes, 5 minutes, and then between 5.25 and 6. So another 30 minutes, well, I can be here later than that. So, what do you need? Uh, I'm just going to turn my stuff in. Okay. If I'm not in the office, you can slide it under my door. Okay. okay. All right. Is this stuff from last time or this time? Uh, last time. Okay. Got to get stuff in on this term, too. So, but yeah. get, get that done first. Yeah. Okay. And you know you got a paper in both, in all your classes, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just make sure I did. Right. Okay. All right. You too.